Well, good morning. Good morning. That was really powerful for a smaller crowd we are this morning. Y'all are great. Very excited to be here. My name's Amanda. I'm one of the pastors here, and so glad that you decided to come out on this snowy, cold morning. Not quite as cold as last week. Do y'all remember how cold it was last week on Sunday? Um, I actually felt like I didn't need to wear my heavy snow coat this morning, even though it's, you know, still 36 degrees. It's not negative 10 like it was earlier this week, and so... I'm glad that you all decided to venture out this morning. I think God has something amazing in store for us. Um, This last week, did anybody play in the snow? Anybody sled? Sled or build a snowman? My niece and I, we had fun playing in the snow. But the snow wasn't the most exciting thing for me this week. Um, On Monday afternoon, as the snow poured down, um, Justin and I got back to the house. I had to pick him up from work. And my sister called, and she said, We're on our way to the hospital And so my nephew was born on Monday night, early Tuesday morning. Um, So he he came in, we call him a snow baby, um, because he brought the snow with him. And I was wondering, you know, sometimes they say if you come in in the midst of a hurricane, you're going to be this really wild child. And so I don't know what it means about coming in in a snowstorm, um, but he did it. And it was such an awesome, awesome thing. He was born at 1.50 a.m. on Tuesday morning. And I was there with my sister and her husband through the entire time. Um, And it was just a really awesome thing. I have a picture of him. He is one of the most beautiful babies I've ever seen. And then the next one will steal your heart. Look at that. Two, I mean, I love them more than than anybody else in the world besides Jesus and my husband. I love them (laughs) that much. Look how sweet that is. That's my niece Eliza holding her baby brother, Daryl Brent Hopkins, um, on Tuesday morning. She didn't get to see him until Tuesday morning, and she was so, so excited. Her biggest adjustment has been, I, don't, I thought Daryl would play with me. All he ever does is sleep and eat. <laughs> and so um, there's a couple other pictures of, of me and little, little Daryl on Friday at the doctor's office for his first well visit with the doctor, and then another one of Justin holding his nephew. He's so, so cute, both of them in that picture. <laughs> Well, I will spend the rest of my life getting to know this little boy. And when I held him, the first thing I said is that I love you so much and I can't wait to find out who you are. Isn't it amazing to think that when you look at a tiny baby, that everything about them is just going to change and they're going to grow into who God has called them to be? And so as I looked at his tiny little face, it got me so excited because I get to be a part of his life. It's such a beautiful thing when God brings life into the world and that we get to be a part of that. And as he is dearly loved, that is what his name means. It's what Daryl means, is dearly loved. And that is what he is. He is the only grandchild of an only child on the side of my brother-in-law. And he's the first grandson on my, my side. And so he will definitely be spoiled rotten, and he will spend the rest of his life feeling dearly loved. And I can't wait to teach him so many new things. That was, that was something I love to do with Eliza. Um, But the thing I hope above all else, above everything else that he learns from very early on, that he'll learn that he is dearly loved by God. Um, Isn't that our prayer for all of our children is that when they're born, that they'll know God's love, that they'll never be able to remember a time when they they didn't know that God loved them, just like my sister and my brother-in-law love him so much from the moment he took his first breath. He will look back and think, I never remember a time when God didn't love me, and that is a really, really beautiful thing. And I hope that he understands that our love for him pales in comparison to the love that he has from the creator of the universe. During this time of year, we too are trying to figure out who we are, just like that little baby will grow into a man someday. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent, and that's a time leading up to Easter. Historically, Lent has been a time we're called to look into ourselves, to examine ourselves. Um, We're invited to examine ourselves and be closer to God and to one another. And so as we journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem, towards the cross during this time of Lent, um, we recognize that Jesus is offering himself for all of us, for all of humanity, and that it's our, um, our desire as Christians to examine ourselves and become who God wants us to be through the power of Jesus Christ. And so Lent is a time when we practice spiritual discipline. Some people give up something Um, Some people take on something. And so this morning, we're going to begin our sermon series that will take us through the season of Lent. It's based on this book, The God We Can Know, exploring the I Am sayings of Jesus. 
It's written by Rob Fuquay. It's a great, great book. And many in our congregation, as their Lenten discipline, have decided to take on the practice of reading this and engaging in devotion around this. Um, you'll hear more a little bit later in the service about all the opportunities you can be a part of in learning around one another. But each week, our sermon series will be a part of this book. And so today, our scripture um, gives us a glimpse into who God is. And so hear this word from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Moses was taking care of the flock for his father-in-law Jethro, Midian's priest. He led his flock out to the edge of the desert, and he came to God's mountain called Horeb. The Lord's messenger appeared to him in a flame of fire in the middle of a bush. Moses saw that the bush was in flames, but it didn't burn up. Then Moses said to himself, Let me check out this amazing sight and find out why this bush isn't burning up. When the Lord saw that he was coming to look, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, he said. Moses said, I'm here. Then the Lord said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. God continued, I am the God of your father, Abraham's God, Isaac's God, and Jacob's God. Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I've clearly seen my people oppressed in Egypt. I've heard their cry of injustice because of their slave masters. I know about their pain. I've come down to rescue them from the Egyptians in order to take them out of that land and bring them to a good and broad land, a land that's full of milk and honey, a place where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites all live. Now the Israelites' cries of injustice have reached me. I've seen just how much the Egyptians have oppressed them. So get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I to go to Pharaoh and to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I'll be with you, and this will show you that I'm the one who sent you. After you bring the people out of Egypt, you will come back here and worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I now come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they're going to ask me, What is this God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we pray that during this time you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. I pray that you would speak through me and in spite of me the message that you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this story that we read in Exodus is really about a name. That's the end of the story. The climax of the story is that we get to hear God tell us God's name. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Have you ever thought about the significance of your name? Does anybody know the meaning of their name? Anybody ever looked it up? Yeah, a few of you. Well, I never realized just how important my name was to me until I thought about changing it. It's one of those things you don't think about until it's, it's right there before you. Um, so many of you all know that I am Amanda Jane Dean, married to Justin Steinman. Uh, we don't share the same last name. We share the same house. We are in covenant with each other. Um, it doesn't make me less of a wife that I didn't take his name. And I'll tell you that it was one of the hardest things. They say that planning a wedding is hard, but no. Cha deciding not to change my name was one of the hardest things. I couldn't quite explain why I was feeling this uncertainty about changing it. I just thought I would do like my mother and her mother had done and change whenever I got married. But from the moment we got engaged, that was the first thing I thought about was this looming on May 24th, my name is going to be different. And Justin, um, he is so supportive of me that he was no help at all because he said, I don't care either way. Whatever you want to do, I, I trust you to make the right decision. I kind of wanted him to fall hard on a line, one line or the other to help me out. Um, so I wrestled with this and wrestled with this. And actually, it was First Broad Street that helped me decide to keep my name. So y'all are responsible, okay? 
Back when we first um, got appointed here or projected to come here, the office upstairs contacted me and said, we want to create your email address. And so we need to know if you're going to be a dean at fbsumc.org or if you're going to be a Steinman at fbsumc.org. Well, I decided, you know what, I'm not willing to give up any part of my name. My name is so special to me. My dad picked out my name after the popular Waylon Jennings song, Amanda, in 1979. <laughs> And he continues to sing it to me to this day. Jane is my mom's maiden name, and so it's a very special name that connects me to my mom's side. And then Dean, I've had this last name for 35 years, and it's just something that I'm really attached to. And so I decided, you know, I'm just going to keep my name, and I'll, I'll just go by his surname. So I'll be Amanda Jane Dean Steinman. And so I, I was responding to this email, and I was responding, and I said, okay, this is my name after I'm married. And I said, I'll be A. Steinman. And then I just started to weep. I couldn't even finish typing. And I couldn't quite understand why I was so upset about this. And so I started thinking right then, why? Why is it so important to me that I stay Amanda Jane Dean? And then I realized that I was baptized Amanda Jane Dean when I was seven. And then I was ordained Amanda Jane Dean when I was 32 and so for me, my name was linked to my ordination. And so I, for me, that was, that was something I just needed to hold on to. Um, that in that moment when the bishop laid, laid hands on me and ordained me for ministry, that that was the name that I was called to use in my life. Um, I'm still a part of the Steinman family. I consider myself a Steinman. If you call me Miss Steinman, I'm not going to be upset or, or frustrated or offended. And I don't, um, I think it's great whether you decide to take your husband's name or not take your husband's name. That's not the thing for me. For me, it was that this was a name that was so very important to me because when those hands were laid on me and I was ordained, this is who God has called me to be. You know, um, in the Hebrew Bible, names are very, very important. They tell you a lot about who that person is. They represent hopes and dreams. They represent characteristics of a person. For example, you remember Jacob. He was wrestling with God, with an angel. Um, he, he was given a new name, um, Israel, which means the one who struggled with God. So knowing the name of a person can give you a lot of insight into who they are, where they come from, the dreams of that person or of their family. And that's why Moses is asking God this question, because names are really, really important. And so when he decides to go out, he wants to know who should I tell them is sending me. In some translations, God says, I am who I am, but others it says, I shall be who I shall be. Both of these translations are possible because they both those words can be to be or to become. When God says, I am who I am, he's actually refusing to be defined by one word. God is saying, I am free. I am not defined by the name God. I am the creator, not the created. And when God said, I shall be who I shall be, God was saying, I am the one who causes things to be. I am the creator of history. And though we may desire to define God more narrowly, knowing that God is I am who I am can give us more confidence in God because God is free. God is undefined. God is present in all times, in all places, in all aspects of our lives. The name of God in the Old Testament was considered so holy that it was unspeakable. People wouldn't even be able to speak the name of God. Within this series, we're going to be talking a lot about I am, the great I am, and all the ways that Jesus embodied that. This series is specifically designed to help us get to know God better, who God is. And by getting to know God better, we believe that we'll be able to know ourselves better because we are created in the image of God, right? One way of viewing the Bible is to see it as a story of God and humanity attempting to get to know one another. Isn't that a great thing that God really wants to get to know us? So what does God saying to Moses, I am, has sent you? What is that? have to do with Jesus in the New Testament. Well, for Jesus to address his audience, who is struggling with life issues like hunger and darkness, a fear, emptiness, 
all those things, he identifies himself as I am. And those people who have been reading, have been hearing scriptures their whole lives would recognize I am. Oh, I've heard that phrase before. And that takes me back to the God that's creator of the universe. I am. I am. The great I am. They would likely have known that story by heart of Moses there at the burning bush and of God telling him his name. So Jesus is identifying himself with the God of Moses. That's really, really important. Because from that point on, everything that God said, that Jesus says has more power because it is the voice of God speaking through Jesus. And Jesus is saying that people's needs, their longings can be met in him because he will be there. He will be there. So as we journey to the cross through this season of Lent, there are three things that I want you to take to heart. And the first is, that God desires a relationship with us. God desires a relationship with us. You know, Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship between God and us, a living relationship that requires nurture and attention. And it's deepened through trust and respect for God and for one another. In Genesis, we read that God creates human beings, but he doesn't just create them and let them go there. He wants to be in relationship with them. And so he walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. He comes and visits with them. He wants to have a relationship with them. And when they go missing, he looks for them because he wants to know where these people that he loves so much are. He wants to be in relationship with them. And so when God speaks to Moses in our scripture reading for today, it's because God wants to have a relationship with Moses. But Moses, um, he's insecure. We don't read it in this passage, but we read it in some others around it, that um, he thinks he's, he can't speak well, he's not confident enough, they're not going to believe me, um, all these different things. And Moses needs reassurance that everything is going to be all right. But God has given, them, God has given him the task of going before the most important person in the world, Pharaoh and Moses, like every one of us, um, wants some guarantee of what is going to happen. He wants to know that when I get up there in front of Pharaoh that the bottom isn't going to drop out and he's going to be in prison forever. A way of getting that assurance for Moses was hearing God share his name. Who shall I say sent me? And God replies, I am. We sometimes speak of God and God's majesty as though God is so separate from us that God is this lofty figure above us that knows everything but doesn't really communicate with us on a, a level um, that we understand. While there are those lofty, amazing, indescribable, miraculous things about God, there is something so approachable, so tangible about God. We never miss out on God's desire for relationship if we are open to it. So that's the first thing, that God desires a relationship with us. The second thing that we are going to focus on is that God equips us with what we need to do his will. Not our will, but his will. So Moses makes all kinds of excuses as to why he can't do this. I'm not respected. And God says, I will be there. Moses says, I'm not an eloquent speaker. And God says, I will be there. Moses protests, I'm not brave. And God says, I will be there. Moses says, I don't even know your name. And God says, I will be there. So in those situations that we all encounter, when we um, question whether we can do the things that God has called us to do, um, it's not more power and ability that we need in order to do those things. What we need is more of God. We need more of God in order to do those things. And God says in every situation, in every question, I will be there. Such a beautiful, beautiful thing to know that we are not alone. The author of this book, Rob Fuquay, he says, God works in real time. God's name is not I have already been. It is not I will be. God's name is I am. God gives us what we need when our feet are where God wants them to be. God's promise is, I will be there as I will be there. That God gives us what we need when we are in God's will for our lives. So that's the second thing. God equips us with what we need to do God's will. 
The third thing that we want you to focus on today and through this series is that we bear the image of the great I am. In this book, uh, Fuquay reminds us that we're not just made by God, we are made out of God. I'm not just made by God, I'm made out of God. It means that we are made out of God's goodness and God's power, God's strength and God's love. And so getting to know God meaning, means getting to know ourselves even better. The more we know who God is, the more we know who we are. And that's what this season of Lent is about. It's about getting to know God more intimately. Getting to know God means getting to know ourselves. In the coming weeks, we'll discover the I am sayings of Jesus. And I love these because Jesus is identifying himself with the great I am of the Old Testament. He says, I am the light of the world. That's what Jesus says, I am. But at the same time, in another place, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So here we are. We are linked to Jesus. We are described as being similar to what Jesus is saying he is. In another passage, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he says, feed my sheep to us, people who are like shepherds in the world. Jesus said, I am the true vine. But he also said, you are the branches. So we're a part of this. He also said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And later on in Acts, his followers are known as people of the way. So we're connected to Jesus in that way. And finally, on the day of Easter, we are going to look at what does it mean for Jesus to say, I'm the resurrection and the life. And he equally promises us life abundant, that we can have eternal life through his power. We'll hear Jesus speak as though he is actually answering our questions about life issues. Things like hunger, things are about our, wor our world today, a need for guidance around our decisions in life, the need for security, the power for living a godly life. And if we take all these I am sayings to heart, I believe that we'll discover a path for developing a closer connection with Jesus, the living relationship he desires to have with us. So, who are you? When somebody asks me that in my brain, I go to, I'm forgetful. Um, I'm clumsy a lot of the time. I, ha I, I have a great fear of speaking in front of people, and yet this is what I'm called to do. Yeah? I'm not up here by any, any of my own, um, my own gifts. It's all God's gifts in me. But how do I tr change that I am forgetful and angry and messy and, and clumsy into those descriptors that are God-given to me? I'll never forget when I was in high school, and it was a really rough period in my life, and there was a Sunday school teacher that gave me a piece of paper. We were talking about names in Sunday school, and we defined all of our names. And so in that moment, I opened up my piece of paper, and my name means worthy of love or beloved. And it was during a time in my life in high school when I felt alienated from everybody around me. I was heartbroken. Um, I didn't feel accepted. I was struggling with my parents' divorce. All those things were piling up on me, and what I needed was to be reminded that I am worthy of love. And that's what my name at its core means, but it's what Jesus says to all of us, is that we are worthy of love. We deserve to be loved. And so, when you hear that the great I am, the one who reminds us I will be there, is calling you, what are you going to say, who am I? Are you loving, forgiving, like Jesus? Are you beautiful, are you compassionate? Are you merciful? So this week, as you go home, as you begin to live into this series of knowing the great I am, the, the God we can know, um, that's your homework, is to figure out what your name means. Um, and even if it's not something you anticipated, like some names are not, that, that the meaning is not, um, it's like from England, it was a surname, that's all you get. Know that um, 
you are beloved. And so in addition to looking up the meaning of your name, which is just kind of cool, I'd love for y'all to write down, I am this and this and this. I am beloved. I am compassionate. I am worthy of love. Remember, we're not just made by God. We are made from God. And so all these things that describe God can describe us as well. So let's remember this week and throughout this series that one, God desires a relationship with us. That is so, so important. Second, that God will give you what you need when you need it to do his will. And third, you bear the image of God. As the band comes up um, to lead us in our last songs, I just want you to think about uh, who God's calling you to be and how, what is your desire this season of Lent? How do you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus and with one another? And as you do that, think of some specific things. Because to think vaguely is great, but to think specifically actually allows us to live into those things. And so um, I'm going to have a prayer for us. And then during this song, if you, if you want to talk to Harrison or me about what God's calling you to do during this season of Lent as you try to grow closer to God as you try to find out who you are, as you look at who Jesus is, um, we invite you to join us. We'll be in the back. We'd love to to hear from you, to pray for you. Um, We'd love to get to know who God is calling you to be. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we can know you, that you have called us to be your people, that you have created us from yourself. And that we can really, really know you and be in relationship with you. God, I thank you that we can read about Jesus in the scriptures and we can hear him speak of who he is. We can be reminded of who we are through him. That you have called us to do many things and that you will be faithful to equip us to do those things that you've called us to So God, I pray that as we move forward into this journey to Easter, that you would help us to examine ourselves deeply. God, that we would be reminded of the relationship you desire to have with us. God, that we would be reminded that we are worthy of your love. God, that you have called us to do great things and you're gonna do those things through us. We don't have to worry about the insecurities we have. We know that you're going to give us what we need to do your will. God, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who reminds us who we are and whose we are. We pray all these things in his precious name. Amen.